business or are you running a business? Valuation is the ultimate KPI. Hey there, it's Mike Langford. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast brought to you by Truelytics, the one and only comprehensive advisor transition management platform. This week on the show, I have a very special treat for you and for me because I have Ian Carnell, the Chief Revenue Officer of Truelytics on with me. And if that last name sounds familiar to you, it should because he is the identical twin brother of Jeremy Carnell, the CEO and co-founder of Truelytics. So, uh, If you like the shows when I have Jeremy on, you're really going to like the shows with Ian. Now, Ian and I, just like Jeremy and I, go way, way back. And in fact, I actually met Ian before I met Jeremy. And it feels like yesterday that the two of us were just meeting for morning coffees or going out to lunch in the financial district in Boston. And uh, fast forward like 25 years, my God, 25 years, uh, here we are recording our first podcast together. We've actually never been on camera or on audio together. So this is going to be a real treat for me. I have great admiration for Ian. He's always been a great friend and at times mentor for me. I think you're going to get a lot out of the show, particularly what I'm interested in hearing from Ian is his fresh perspective on the industry, right? Ian is not a lifer from the wealth management space. He has had some connections to it here and there through the businesses that he's been in over the course of his career. But he's not like us, right? Where I've basically been in wealth management my entire life. And sometimes when you bring somebody in from outside of the space, they can bring a fresh set of eyes, right? They can see things like opportunities that you and I might have missed. They can hear things being articulated from advisors and executives at wealth management firms that maybe, you know, for us, it just kind of goes over our head because we've heard it a million times. So I'm really, really excited to hear that fresh perspective. Again, Ian, somebody that I've known for a very long time, pretty much almost my whole adult life. Uh, He's really, really bright. And he's that type of dude who really sees new stuff. He's got this great eye for innovative ideas and seeing trends like where the world is headed. So you are going to love this conversation. Okay. Before we get started, as always, please do make sure you send in your questions or suggestions for guests or topics for the show. You can reach us at podcast at truelytics.com or you can swing by truelytics.com, use that contact form. And of course, hit us up on the socials. We are active on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, the YouTubes. Love to hear from you there. And if you're leaving a comment, also make sure you give it a like and a share with your network because of course, they're gonna wanna hear this conversation as well. And if you wanna follow up with me, I'm at Mike Langford, basically everywhere. I'm real easy to find. I, I am the Mike Langford, but don't put the D on there. Just at Mike Langford, super duper easy. Okay. Lastly, if you haven't done so already, please do make sure you subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud. Again, YouTube, wherever you'd like to get your podcast jam on, you can find us there. Okay. All right. Let's get to the conversation with Ian Carnell, the Chief Revenue Officer of Truelytics. Ian Carnell. <laughs> So magnificently awesome to see you on my screen. Finally, I've been like waiting for this for like six months. So uh, welcome to your first appearance on the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. It's it's a privilege to be here. It's good. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> You're very Especially, welcome. I mean, I mean, I mean, we we go way back. I mean, we yeah. go back to Boston, our Boston yeah. days with you at State Street, and yeah. you know, uh, it's me so, running a digital agency. Yeah, it's so <laughs> fascinating when you realize that there are friends that you have. Uh, yeah. and, and now and colleagues as well that you're like I've known you for 25 years basically my almost yeah. my entire yeah. adult life you and I <laughs> have been in each other's lives and they're like this is really yeah. wild I moved to Austin and they're like literally I think the year after you moved to Austin and then Jeremy yeah. follows and it's just such a wild experience you realize damn this dude's been in my life for like 25 yeah. years it's really really cool <laughs> it's amazing uh you know it is I'm really excited to have you on the show, not just because we go way, way back and you know, it, it's, uh, you have this fresh perspective, right? So you, you joined Truelytics in November as chief mm-hmm. revenue officer. That position didn't exist before. Right, correct. And you don't have, you know, 25 years of experience in the wealth management industry like I do, right? Like I've been in this no, pretty much a whole career. I had zero. Right? Yeah, you had zero. I mean, I started my career answering phones for mutual fund companies, right? When I was still in college. <laughs> and so I've kind of like nerding out on this stuff for my whole life. And and I was actually talking to somebody yesterday at, at another firm and, and we were talking about how like you sometimes forget 
how you, we just know stuff. You just, cause you just know it. You've been in the industry for so right. long. And, and I'm really excited to have you on the show because you have a, a fresh perspective. Here comes somebody who has got a wealth of it's just fantastic business experience and in, in, in different industries. And you've got a variety of them, but mm-hmm. here you are looking at our space through a set of fresh eyes. So it's wonderful to have you here. And I can't wait to pick your brain about what you're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the bulk, I mean, the, I mean, not the bulk. I mean, the entire kind of my entire career has been predominantly centered around ad tech. So I come out of the ad tech industry and this is my first, you know, this is my first foray. Now, one of my biggest accounts in ad tech was State Street. I mean, that's, you know, when we met way back. So, yeah. so you know, I knew them as a custodian, one of the world's largest custodian. I got to know that part of the business. We had a pretty big financial services practice within our agency. So I, I've certainly, you know, kind of been in the orbit of the industry, but I haven't worked at all full time within this industry. And it's a whole different beast entirely when you, when you kind of switch industries. and um, and you get into learning the acronyms and the nuances of the industry. So yeah, it's been, it's been uh, a, a pretty steep learning curve over the last six months. Yeah. So <laughs> like, it wasn't really, e- it wasn't like super easy to re- realize oh, I got an RIA, then I got an IAR, which is not an RIA. You know? <laughs> right. Oh, it's crazy. Um, yeah. And then OSJs and broker yeah. dealers. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, it's it's um it, it's been a lot of fun, some some head scratching from time to time, yeah, yeah. but but I'm getting there. Yeah, so. yeah, it's the the alphabet soup is really yeah challenging for especially for anybody new. And, and by the way, this would be the same yeah. thing if you pulled a financial advisor or an executive from a financial firm and plopped them down in a Silicon Valley tech place, they'd be like, "What is happening here?" Or over into ad tech, where yeah, I come from. True. I mean, yeah. we have this we have the same issue, right? I mean, it's a foreign language entirely, so. Yeah. Uh, we do that to keep others out. So. Right. <laughs> this is the gatekeeping game. Well, and, and, right. it, and it's interesting too, like a, a mutual friend of ours, Jamie um, Punishel once said, Punishel, yes. yeah, you know, you know, so we, so I we, know Jamie we, well. Yeah. Go to LinkedIn. Yeah. If you don't know who Jamie is, I don't know where he works right now, but go check him out. We'll put a link to his thing in the show notes, maybe. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> mutual friend, uh, Jamie and I were talking one time and he said something really interesting to me. He's like, listen, this is an industry that innovates from within, right? That it, 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 because it's so heavily regulated that very often it's difficult for innovation to come from outside because many of the people that work in these companies are lifers, right? They've, they've been here right. for like 20, right. 40, 30 years, right? So right. you're selling into a State Street or a Fidelity or these really large right. firms. People, they, they, they've been there for a long time and they have a lot of institutionalized knowledge. And so... Uh, that what I've seen is it's changed over the last few years, though, you, 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 the last decade or so, because the pace of innovation outside of the industry is going so fast, right? They're needing to bring in fresh, fresh faces and, and fresh minds. So, uh, Correct. that's where you come in. Love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you as I, as I thought about having you on the show was what are some key pain points for advisors in 2021, right? Because You've invested a ton of time as chief revenue officer going out and talking to advisors, executives at wealth management firms, influencers in yep. the space, right? Yep. And yep. because you're coming at it from a, a, a novice, right? A newbie's perspective, you're probably picking up on some things that maybe we haven't talked about on this show before. So I was going to like, what are some of the things that you're noticing that are like, hey, this is a real pain point for advisors and, and wealth management firms that they're affiliated with? Yeah, a lot of that, uh, the catalyst for a lot of those pain points, it, you know, is this kind of massive transition that the industry is in, right? Um, and, you know, and, it, and it, it has brought about a lot of pain, both inside of their business and outside of their business. And, you know, this is an industry that has been dominated by professional service firms, you know, within this sector, sp- particularly and particularly with respect to transitions. Um, and, 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 you know, that's all fine and good, but they're costly and it's a convoluted space. And there's really kind of a dearth of data-led and kind of platform-based solutions to make it easy to kind of address these pain points. And so one of the reasons where we exist today is to do that. And, you know, and a lot of those pain points that we're, that we're addressing are pain points with respect to how advisors are valuing their firm as part of 
this transition that's going on. What specific things can they do to drive that valuation? Can you give them a roadmap that's data driven? You know, how do, how do you help them find the right buyers or sellers? How do you match them programmatically? How do you improve their recruitment efforts? Uh, you know, things like that are, are some of the pain points that we're hearing, which, you know, which is congruent with what you would expect to hear with an industry going through you know, this massive transition in the space. I like that you've, you mentioned that there's been a lack of data-driven approach to the concept of transition because I think you're 100% right. I think there's been a lot of finger in the wind. Uh, yep. is, is this feels about right. You know, maybe I'll take the three iron out for this one. Uh, and, and part of that is because, number one, most advisors only go through transition, you know, exit specifically once, right? They're only going to do right. this one time. Right. We're also right. in the very first wave of OG financial advisors transitioning out yep. of the business, right? Like this is a That's relatively correct. new profession. And the people who are financial advisors, we consider financial advisors, it's, it's brand new. Right. For that. Right. And so, right. but the other thing is that the, the businesses that have been serving or, you know, the consultants and the like and valuation firms that have been consulting traditionally in this space, they're kind of like, there's a bespoke approach, right? They're, they'd be right. surprised at how many firms are using a spreadsheet and they're like, oh yeah, here's what your business is worth. Right. Or they're picking up a, a right. magazine that says, you know, uh, 15 businesses sold last year. The average multiple was this, and, and it puts these ideas in people's heads. So you're right. Like the, a data-driven approach, I mean, you would never yeah. manage a client's portfolio that way with it. Yeah, we're winging it. Yeah. No, no. I, one, of the, one of the very first phone calls I had when I joined a CRO, um, we were talking to an advisor, and we asked the question, like, how are you, you know, how are you, well, we were, we were speaking to a consultant to advisors, and and we asked, like, how are you, de you know, deriving valuation today? And he held up, you know, his pad of paper and his pen, you know, and doing just some calculations there. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it was eye-opening. And it's been consistent with almost every other phone call that we've had or meeting that we've had is that the industry itself has embraced data as the foundation for driving a lot of financial products. Very, we, we've seen very few data-driven, platform-driven initiatives to help the advisor or the large broker dealer address business optimization or strategic selling, practice management, things like that. So there's a, there's a huge delta between the two. I, I, I find that ironic, but, but it's not uncommon in any industry that, yeah. you know, that you, you find that I, I think financial services, particularly lags relative to some of these other industries that uh, particularly ad tech. I mean, I think ad tech is really at the forefront of how they embrace technology to, to, to drive growth within their own business or transition with their business, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So. I love that we're having this conversation specifically because it is, you know, one thing that we always try to keep in mind is advisors are running small businesses. I mean, even if they yeah. have a billion dollars AUM, chances mm -hmm. are there's less than 20 people working at that company. Correct. Right? right. That's a really small right. business, right? Even though it's, you know, generating right. you know, millions of dollars of revenue, usually, you know, less than, less than 10 million, but still it's a, it's a small business by every definition there is. So a few people, not a huge amount right. of revenue. It's, it's a right. great business, right? but they're, they're not going to have all these sophisticated uh, data analytics tools when it comes to you know, managing the business, finding out where there's, there's some weaknesses and some strengths, understanding the value right. of the business and transition. So it's really, again, it's, it's so exciting to be at this forefront of like how that's changing, you know? And, and, and yeah. having, again, you've seen it in your other, other spaces, right? Like you, you're, you come from yeah. a space, ad tech comes from a space where the investment in technology has been massive. Um, right. There's a very high rate of transition and acquisitions, right? Like in, in that space, right. Right? you're always hearing about one agency acquiring another, one agency right. or, or tech firm acquiring another tech firm in the space, right? Because it's just it's just moving at a blistering pace. But this is an industry where you can, you, you can be a little like, eh, chill, no, I can wait. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when you think of when you think of some the catalyst in ad like in advertising and what drove the disruption in that market and the transition in that market, 
it was the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And so up until that point, you had traditional media driving that and driven by the same demographic of leaders that are, you know, kind of at the helm of these RIAs today. (laughs) And so, you know, and that are looking at retirement and looking to kind of transition out. And so, so although not the same kind of, you know, I mean, not, not the same kind of catalyst per se, even though, you know, the internet has led to data-driven SaaS-based platforms that are solving these particularly challenging solutions that, as I said before, have been the domain of professional service firms up until this point. You know, the, the catalyst here is just, you have an industry, first generation industry, that is looking at retirement for the first time and trillions of dollars of AUM are in flux. And, and there are dynamics both for the individual advisor and for the large institutions, the enterprises, the, the broker dealers and the large multi-office RIAs and OSJs that are looking to benefit from this transition. Yeah. They're looking, they have the resources to disproportionately benefit and, you know, obtaining this AUM, you know, these trillions of dollars that are, that are becoming available. But the small guys also see that as well. Like I, I know, I know an advisor. I, I, have, a, I have a relationship with a, a, a gentleman who runs an RIA in Houston, and it's like a fifty million in AUM. But you know, he was telling me about a, a deal he's brokering to to acquire another RIA um, that's a half billion in AUM. I like he's just swinging for the fences. I love that. I mean, and that's not inconsistent with some of the advisors who are younger, more tech savvy, wanting to make some moves in this market and take advantage. Of, of these trends. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that story. I want to meet this guy. Yeah. Isn't that great? Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is true. By the way, that that's not uncommon in other business lines, right? That a smaller business yeah. will find a way to acquire a larger business through, you know, or, or take over, right? right. And in that case, it might be a, a, an innovative succession plan, buy his way into the business and be the person who right. takes over at some point in time through financing. Um, that's fascinating. You know, what's really interesting to me too, that I've noticed over the years is, and, and it's always worth pointing out. The broker dealers themselves, the, the, the larger enterprises are often a lot smaller operation than people might think of from right. the outside, right? So uh, the right. marketing teams, as, a, as an example, at most broker dealers is like maybe three people. Very often right. it's one person, right? And so as they're thinking about, hey, we've got hundreds, if not thousands of financial advisors, some of these people are getting ready to transition out of the business that becomes somewhat of an existential problem, right? Yeah. If not handled yeah. correctly. And, and one way to handle it correctly is through technology at scale, right? With, with the TrueLytic solutions. Right, right. Well, and I think broker dealers, I mean, I mean, their margins are relatively thin to begin with. So, you know, they're not, they're not, you know, they have to be careful in expenditures and R and D. Um, but, but that's not uncommon. I mean, I mean some of the large, some of the larger institutions, I mean, also have this challenge as well. I mean, they're just, they're, they're, you know, mammoth. They can't get out of their own way. They're too slow to adapt technology or adopt technology, I should say. You know, I remember back in my ad agency days, uh, we were working with PNC Bank. And I remember like, I mean, that, that's a big, you know, super regional bank. And they had, they had taken, you know, pretty significant steps. And this was, you know, I don't know, a decade and a half ago to create, an innovation group within the company to like incubate kind of startups within PNC so that they could kind of get out of their own way. I, you know, and, and I wouldn't be surprised again, I'm six months into this industry, so I haven't, I haven't run across that yet, but I wouldn't be surprised that we start seeing more and more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised either. Yeah. Uh, shifting gears a little bit to the kind of the flip side of this co- this conversation uh let's switch to the opportunity side right the, the area where people are enthusiastic because you know i think very often it's easy for us to go like hey this is what's wrong this is what needs to be fixed and all that type of stuff yeah. but you know i think there's a lot of enthusiasm as well have you been talking to advisors and to to firms and, and hearing them going you know what really excites us is this is what we're trying to go after what we're trying to uh, grow to or or the opportunity we're looking to seize here in 2021 and beyond. We have, and, and, and there's some exciting calls that we have had. I mean, it's, it's really exciting to see. There are some younger advisors who are building their RIA, relatively new to the game, um, but very, very tech savvy, very comfortable with technology, very comfortable and wanting to leverage data to drive not only insights, but differentiation in the marketplace. And, 
um, you know, one of what one, one of the early um, um, kind of uh, closed one opportunities that that I that I was um, part of after I joined the company uh, was a smaller RIA that um, it was a husband and wife team. And they were I mean, they were young, very hungry, very smart very, you know, uh, very comfortable with technology, looking to differentiate themselves with a data-driven platform um, and, you know, immediately got our value proposition and immediately embraced how, how the platform can help them compete more effectively in this marketplace. And they were just getting going. And it's, it's crazy when I juxtapose that conversation with some of the conversations I have with much larger RIAs that are, that are really confronting some of the real problems and issues that, that, you know, that we can solve. And it's just, a, it's, it's depending on, again, who you're talking to, the role, the demographic, it's, it's just an you know, entirely different conversation. Yeah. So that excites me, right? I mean, so part of this transition is leading to, yes, I think we're seeing, you know, I, I think we are seeing the industry collapse up. I think we are seeing disproportionately some of these large OSJs, multi-office RAAs, broker-dealers, you know, disproportionately benefit from this transition. But you're also going to see a, this next generation of leaders, business leaders, come into the market and embrace technology and data differently. I mean, I was, I was also on the phone with um, some Morningstar executives earlier this week, and it was great because they – they confirmed that, you know, the advisor segment is increasingly becoming more professional, you know, from a business standpoint versus kind of a lifestyle standpoint, which I think we saw disproportionately in this first generation that's, you know, looking at retirement for the first time. Um, and so they're beginning to, you know, again, they're beginning to seek out more data-driven products and platforms to help them scale their business and differentiate their business in the marketplace. I'm glad you pointed that out, that they're beginning... Yeah more business focused, right? In terms of like treating it like a real business versus yeah. a lot of the first generation. And I think I'm obligated to say this every episode because I seem to say this every episode. So it's not the feel way, but like the first generation, most of them got their start as stockbrokers, right? They were sales right. men and women. They're, they're, they're hey, here's, yeah. here's, here's the phone book, start dialing for dollars, right? Just like they show you in the movies, right? <laughs> Call everybody you know, and then start using this list. But, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way, but what ended up happening is you you grew the business as it's a book of business. Like these are I'm selling into right. this group of people, and you had this job right. that you owned in in many ways. It, it, but the the younger generation, and we're talking like people who are in their 40s now, like we're still talking like you right. know, like their careers early in their careers, they had the internet from right. day one, right? Like they they entered the right. workforce had the internet. Uh, they they understand how powerful the internet is. They understand how powerful tech can be. And growing a business, they understand you know, doing things like we're doing, right? We're talking face to face right. over the internet, right? right. Now. They get that, right. right? These are the first generation that are probably coming at this business, going, "Yeah, I'm, of course I'm going to get my CFP. Of course I'm going to like be a yes. professional financial planner. Like that's some things I'm going to be able to want to do. I'm going to want to have other service offerings in my business in addition to asset management. I'm also going to want to offer maybe some accounting or tax planning or whatever, right? So they're they're thinking about it much more business like. So I really like that you pointed that out. Yeah. 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 Really cool. Uh, Now, here's one. This is my favorite question. I want to have because, like, so you spent all this time, six months in, right? So I'm thinking this is the time to ask you this one. Uh, What surprised you so far the most? Because anytime you get into a new business, you know, the first couple of months, your head's spinning, drinking from the fire hose, trying to figure out, like you said, the, the alphabet soup. Uh, then you start the, you know, all right, I got it. My sea legs are feeling here. You, you know, you, you've been doing it for a little while. Now you're starting to feel like a pro. You've been at this for six months. You kind of, you know, the business. Oh, you know I'm, the people. I, I'm nowhere near feeling like I'm a pro. No, yet. No, no, you're you're, you have to lower that bar. You have to lower <laughs> that bar. There's no way I feel like a pro yet. That's Not in this great. industry. Yeah. <laughs> it's on my sea legs. But okay. Like, okay, well be that as it may, I'm sure some things have been like, that's interesting. I'd never thought of that. Or that's surprising to me that it, and it could be a good surprise, by the way, this does not have to be like a, holy crap, this is a, what is wrong with you people type of question. But like, is there anything you like, just kind of like wowed you a bit? Well, I mean, I think I, I, I didn't, I mean, we've been, you know, this is, I'm, this has been the theme I think so far in this conversation. I mean, I think for me, um, I, you know, I kind of came into this industry thinking it would be, you know, much more competitive. Um, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I was very aware when my brother was 
founding the business a few years ago or part of that founding team. And, you know, and I kind of at a, at a, at a surface level knew their value proposition and, um, you know, but it was in, you know, wealth management, it was in financial services and, and I just, you know, kind of my, my supposition was that there, you know, this would be a marketplace that was highly competitive where mm-hmm. there would be, you know, kind of a wealth of options and an industry that uses data and technology for a lot of their financial products and to, to, you know, to benefit their customers. And I think for me coming in as a CRO, uh, as somebody formalizing revenue operations for a fintech platform like Trulytics, I, I've been surprised at the, at the marketplace. For me, the biggest surprise is just there's not a lot of competition yet. And, and that's good and bad. You know, I, I think, you know, both, both are at play here. It's good in that I'm not having to answer questions with respect to how we're differentiated from other platforms similar to ours, because there aren't any, we get questions a lot about, you know, how we're differentiated from a pro serve company, mm. which is, you know, that's, that's mostly the type of who are you closest to type of questions that we get. But it's also challenging in a way as well, because we're having to educate the market because it's, you know, we don't have a lot of competition out there. So when you look at our core value proposition and you look at, you know, the education that, you know, that curve that we have to go through in the buyer's journey to, to, you know, you know start that conversation, build that relationship and, and understand kind of where these pain points are and connect the dots back to the problems that we're solving as a company and as a platform. You know, it's certainly, if, if this was a slightly more mature kind of part of the fintech, fintech industry, that would already be in place. We wouldn't necessarily be having to kind of spend the time doing that. We'd be spending more time, you know, talking about how we're differentiated from the other platforms. So it's both good and bad. But that's, that's, that was, that's been the biggest surprise for me. That, uh, I'm glad you're bringing that up because you're, you're yeah. being the... Uh, early, uh, you know, uh, player, right. To be able to, one of the yep. first out of the gate, right. Uh, in this yep. space, you're, you're creating the market. You're, cre- you're, you're setting Correct. the stage for people. And, 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 and yep. much of what we have to do here is kind of evangelize a little bit. Like, Hey, here are the things you need to be thinking about, right. If you're thinking about Correct. acquiring another business, if you're thinking about selling your business, if you're thinking right. about doing an M and a, uh, or succession planning, like we need to get you thinking in a, in a, in a new way. Right. Right. And here's how right. technology can help you. So that's, that's a really, it is true. Yeah, you're right. Like this. Yeah. Uh, and it, maybe it's because we're still in first generation that there hasn't been like this uh, wealth of other people trying to do this. And I would also say yeah. part of the other reason is, and because I've been, you know, with Trulytics team for, you know, three years now. Yep. It's hard. It's very hard. There's yes. Difficult. It's, it's not an easy nut to crack, right? It's, it's yep. not like some two dudes in their dorm room can spool up an app and right throw it out there and it's going to happen. You know, one of the things about right. this space, and by the way, I think advisors can appreciate this as well. And, it, and, and, and the, 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 the broker dealer firms can appreciate this as well. And when you think about technology, a lot of times you think about hockey stick growth. You think about things that are going to go really quick, you know, the growth. And in right. this space, it's a very long sales cycle, right? Yeah. Uh, into a financial firm. And for advisors too, like they, they get it. Like you meet a client, they don't immediately go, Hey, wonderful meeting you. Here's all my money. Let's go. Right. It usually takes yeah. a while. Yeah. And even if they do love you, it might take you know several months before the assets land in the account, or it right. might take several years because they're waiting for a rollover and so forth. So the relationship's really tiny until they switch jobs or whatever. And I think Trulytics kind of echoes that a bit too. Like there's a bit of education here, but once people are in, it's like, yeah, this is the jam. It works. Yeah. And you have, I mean, you, you know, obviously there are different obstacles for different customer segments. You know, I mean, our, you know, we're not, I mean, for the individual advisor, you know, we've already established that their focus on business practices and using data and platforms to solve for issues around how to optimize business practices, be it practice management, be it valuations, be it, you know, um, uh, succession planning, whatever. Uh, that's one of the hurdles, right? You have to, you know, because the, it hasn't been a primary focus. I mean, it's been predominantly a lifestyle business for, for some of them. You know, the, you have to, the, there's a pretty steep learning curve there that you have to go through. There's a demographic, you know, kind of hurdle as well. Um, you're talking to a generation that didn't grow up with technology, didn't grow up with cloud-based solutions. 
And so, you know, that's, that becomes a hurdle, you know, at the, at the, at the higher end of the market, when we're talking to executives at, you know, BlackRock or, you know, whatever large broker deal, I mean, we have, we have a lot of large broker dealer relationships that license our platform. I mean, you, 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 there are just different issues there, right? It's just the size of these organizations and the, 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 the amount of alignment that you have to and buy-in that you have to establish in these, in these large enterprises. And those sales cycles are just longer for different reasons, right? Yeah. They, have, they, have the, they have the team members that understand and value innovation and technology and data. It's just, it's a completely different set of hurdles there with respect to navigating the many hallways of these large enterprises. Yeah, 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 totally get it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Before we go into the next question that I had sent over to you, I just, you, you made me yeah. think of something because you talked about, and I think advisors will get a lot out of this. This is why I want to ask you this question. You're yeah. talking about coming in as a CRO and you have, for those who, you know, obviously you're chief revenue officer, you must have some experience, you know, developing revenue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <lacking concept. laughs> yeah. But as long as I've known you, 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 you you've had a, a, an exceptional talent for sales, right? You just, you, you have a really, um, a fine-tuned sense for like sensing what what's the issue what's what's going to drive the potential buyer what, what what's uh again what's their the pain point what's their pleasure point that they're seeking whatever you've always been really good at that uh yeah when you talk to an advisor population one of the things they're almost always looking for is i need to grow my business i need new clients right. i want to grow right right you talked about how you came into Truelytics and you're kind of standing up some of the formalizing things. If you had to offer yeah. advisors, and I know this is kind of, a, if you get the solo advisor at all, but if you had to offer like a couple of quick tips of like, all right, here's how you can formalize that revenue yeah. generating process. What are the things you'd, you'd say, hey, look here first, you know, the one, two, yep. three, like high level stuff. What would you advise them to do? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's some basic blocking and tackling, I think, um, for for any advisor you know, kind of getting going or looking to kind of more formalize their revenue operations to scale their business. I think, I think selecting a solid CRM is really, really important. That's foundational to any RevOps initiative or, you know, or strategy that you want to implement. We're big fans of HubSpot, you know, huge fans of HubSpot. And, you know, both my brother and I have used and leveraged HubSpot and the multitude of different tech startups that we have built and sold. And, and it's kind of the cornerstone for our rev ops in every company that we've, we've started. I, you know, it's, it's important to define who your market segments are, uh, to define, you know, what, what qualifies as a deal, what your pipeline looks like and how to manage that process. I mean, that's part of formalizing your business practices in kind of how you go to market, you know, and so that you have command and control around that. So it's not reactive. It's much more of a disciplined approach to where you spend your time, how you prioritize your time, how you, def how you define who is your ideal customer and what that process looks like. And how do you map that process from, the, you know, the, from a buyer journey perspective, like how you initiate that relationship nurture that relationship and ultimately, you know, you know, convert that relationship. And, and I think platforms like HubSpot, I mean, they're, many more options um, from a CRM perspective than just HubSpot. But why that helps is, you know, you really, the, the digital exhaust that comes off a platform like HubSpot, um, you know, is really, really valuable. Your ability to understand, and again, this is using data as a way to inform how you run your business and, and where you spend your time and, and where, you know, what investments you make. And what, what are the returns on that investment? That, that's critical, I think, in any startup. And it's often overlooked in many ways. And so I would say, I mean, you know, you know and that's one of the very first things I did when, when I joined the Trulytics team. They were already using HubSpot. That wasn't the issue. The, you know, the issue was looking at how they were defining customer segments, how they were scoring those segments, because, you know, you can leverage these platforms have really advanced algorithms now and AI that can, that can give you lead scores yeah. based on engagement data. Like how many times did they hit your website? Are, how many times are they engaging your emails? You know, uh, how many times did they pick up the phone when you called them? 
and they look at all of these different signals and they can, you know, they can give you insights into, is this a deal that can likely close or not? You also want to understand deal velocity. How quickly can you get from point A to point B in closing a deal? And, you know, all of the, you don't need, I mean, we have, we're seven people at Trilytics. We're not a, we're not a 40, 50, 60 person company. We're, you know, we're a, a, a seven person FinTech platform that's running a, you know, a multi-million dollar business in the wealth management sector. And it's because we can leverage platforms like this to help gain the insights, help us manage the business and make you know, better business decisions. I think it's so smart so. that you said that. And I'm glad I asked this question, yeah. by the way. Again, you're the, one of the best at it that I've ever met. The oh, reason why I ask that question is, oftentimes you talk to advisors and you ask them where new business comes from, they'll tell you it comes from yeah. referrals. And yeah, yeah. if you ask the follow-up question of like, well, where do you get your referrals? It's a little bit like, eh, you know, I mean, they happen. Like, so there's a lot of right. hoping and waiting that new, new yep. deals come. But yet when you survey and talk to advisors, it's often the thing they want most is more business. And so it's, it's, I wanted to just get, get your take on it. I think it's really smart that you talked about, you know, kind of formalizing yeah. your process, identifying what actually is a deal understanding how yep. long does it take to close a deal? Like what, you know, and yep. where are those deals coming from? Just, it doesn't have to right. sound complicated. Exactly. What you said it's like, yes, you can use HubSpot right. or Redtail or some other CRM or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. You can exactly. Use, hell, you could even use, you know, Outlook or something like that, but like having a process yeah. in place to go, okay, this is what I did to bring in this prospective deal. This is where they are in the process and, and tracking along right. much better than going, I get referrals. They happen. Well, and, and, <laughs> and a lot of these, I mean, and even if you get referrals, I mean, the issue is again, you know, I think for a lot of, a lot of advisors that are, you know, um, not necessarily kind of focus on business practices, you know, they're just reactive. And so you might get a referral and if that referral is hot, great. You might be able to kind of mm. close that pretty quickly, but some referrals take more time. They need, they need nurturing. And I think over time that can become, that, that can become quite, that, it can become burdensome um, because some of that will, a lot of that will just fall through the cracks unless you are using a CRM to help you look at aging, to help you set up automated workflows so that you can, you can become like, again, a two person, three person, four person, five person RAA, you know, leveraging these types of platforms can look like a much bigger company because you can set up workflows and automations that, you know, really take the, sh the, the, the stress off of having to manually follow up with everyone. You can, you can build these types of workflows and automations within these platforms and, and help you identify how you prioritize your day. And so it's, it's really about, you know, at the end of the day, what's going to drive the most effective results for your business. And, and again, leveraging, again, the theme, the theme of this podcast, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think leveraging data and platforms like you know, like Trulytics or like a HubSpot, um, I think gives you, you know, a, a competitive advantage in the marketplace for those who Fantastic. embrace it. Fantastic. Like yeah. I said, glad I asked this question. It's going to be really valuable for the listeners. Okay. Yeah. Wrapping it up here. This one is kind of like my favorite question I saved for the end. Well, actually, I already said that yeah. one was my favorite. Okay. So this is my second favorite. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So, uh, you know, as a chief revenue officer, you're yeah. obviously looking to drive revenue growth. It's in the name kind of uh, and revenue growth for Trulytics is going to come in the same way that it comes for the advisors, right? You're going to expand business by selling more stuff to your same clients or right. selling more of your same product, or right. you're going to grow by getting new clients or through introducing new products to the, right. the space. And so right. for advisors and, and wealth management executives who are listening or watching the show on, on YouTube or wherever they, they like to hang out, uh, <laughs> What, what would you like to know about their business that, you know, Trulytics could help them with, right? So like, you're obviously, you're poking and prodding and so forth and asking questions. Right. But, you know, if, if somebody's listening, like, oh, you know what we really need help with? This. Yeah. Uh, what are you dying to know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I have a love hate relationship with the title chief revenue officer because, <laughs> um, because it makes it about, you know, your company and it's yeah. about revenue growth for your company. And um, I think effective sales leaders make it about their customer's company, right? Yeah. And the customer's issues and challenges. I, I, kinda, I, I better like kind of chief growth officer because it can play both ways, right? Yeah. I can play, uh, you know, it, can, it, it certainly has meaning within your own company because you're, you're kind of charged with leading, you know, the growth of the company, but, but it also plays in, 
kind of the, the, the prospective customer's court as well, because in many ways you're helping them think about how to solve their problems, how to overcome their gating issues to, to, to either grow or go through this like massive transition. And so for us, and, for, and particularly for Trulytics, um, you know, the, we, it's interesting because we've thought a lot about this and we've made some massive updates to our platform recently. In our most recent release, we've, we announced some new enhancements to our platform, one of them being unified dashboards. And so we really began to think through this question about how do we reduce the delta between somebody signing on our platform and, and getting immediate value from our platform? How do we, how do we, how do we reduce that delta? And that obviously led us to, you know, you know, understanding the, you know, the challenges confronted by many of our customers and a lot of them tie back to, you know, what their primary business objective is. Um, and so in this new release that we just, you know, that we just announced a week ago, we announced unified dashboards and the unified dashboard concept really allows our customers to come on to, to sign into our platform and, and, one of the first steps is to is to identify for us what their primary business objective is and based on that primary business objective our dashboards immediately you know uh, uh, customize themselves based on that primary business objectives and it will give you not only data insights it will give you steps to engage our platform so that we're helping you immediately achieve that business that, that whatever that primary business objective is and so that's like that's the thing I'm dying to know, like on my phone calls today, I'm trying to get from my customers an understanding of what their primary business objective, is it practice optimization? Is it finding a successor? Is it business continuity, strategic growth, external sale, exploring a merger or acquisition? Any one of those primary business objectives is a use case we solve for in our platform. And I can speak specifically to the value of our platform and how we solve for that and really kind of clearly, you know, demonstrate the value very early on in those conversations. And so those are the things I'm trying to get at. The demos are great because when they give me that information, I can put that right into the platform, show them how the unified dashboard immediately adapts itself to that primary business objective, and then lead them through kind of a multi-step process to demonstrate to them, this is how the platform can impact your business today. And this is the value that you can realize today. I love it. I love it. That's fa and this is a fantastic way to wrap it up here. It really is. Like yeah. you're putting the customer first and asking them, yeah. you know, what are the problems yeah. you're trying to solve for? Because, yeah. you know, that is what you're here for, right? You have just developed this product, right. as you said, to sell and make money. It's like, hey, look, we're trying to help you guys navigate this, this right. tra transition process and we can help, but you got to tell us a little bit more, right? Like, right. are we helping you the way you want to be helped? I love it. I love it. Well, Ian, right. this has been fantastic. Great catching up, uh, but also just really getting some great insights from you. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. I'm sure some people are going to want to follow up. You're welcome. What's the best way for people yep. to get in touch with you? Well, there's really two ways. One is my email, ian at trulytics.com. And the second way is if you go to trulytics.com, you'll see a little chat window in the bottom right. And that's my picture. I and so it. you can chat with me directly that way. So you can find me on our website, shoot me a chat or shoot me an email. I'll get you my cell phone number and, and we can go from there. Dude, you, uh, by the way, before we let you, uh, before we let people go, uh, they got to hear this. So <laughs> I was really tempted so many times when I go to the <laughs> website to just click on it. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to click on it and mess with them. Just gonna text it. So don't mess with them. But anyways, I was very tempted to do it. And one last no, thing. It, uh, it goes directly to me. And I, and I, I answer those um, pretty quickly. That's great. Well, <laughs> yeah. now you're going to hear from us. Yeah. Like, hey dude, what are you doing? That's um, awesome. <laughs> so by the way, for everybody else who's listening, well, I always encourage people to follow Trulytics on LinkedIn to, to engage yeah. with us there. Uh, you're on LinkedIn. I know you are. Yep. But by the way, I've, I, I've done seminars on LinkedIn usage and all this type of stuff over the years for advisors specifically. I've, I've trained many, yep. many uh, hundreds, probably in the thousands now of advisors on how to use LinkedIn. Ian Carnell is the gentleman who turned me on to LinkedIn very early on. And <laughs> Ian, and I, Ian and I are both one of the first 1 million LinkedIn users. Yes. We are. We are very, <laughs> I'm a 169,000 and change. So we're, uh, we're really, really early LinkedIn users. Yeah, I have to I look at, I have to look at when I logged in or for, for the first time. I know I yeah. can get that number from yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah I'm I like have to look 169 that up. and change. I can't remember the exact number, uh, but the, 
Uh, I still remember very, and, and for those of you who are like leveraging this technology, remember when Ian and I got our start, you had to convince people to use that tool. You had to like say, no, trust me, it's going to oh be good. God. You put your resume stuff in there. People can follow you, connect with you. You can six, six degrees of separation stuff. And people will be like, why would I want my information on the internet? Well, but th this is the same time that people were still talking about the internet being a fad. So, right. you know, this was, this is a different time entirely. Yeah. <laughs> but this just goes to show you how quickly we have changed it. And yeah. so um, anyway, dude, I'm really grateful that you came on the show. Likewise, Wonderful Michael. having you on here. Thank you very much for sharing everything. And uh, awesome. see you next time. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thanks, brother. Take care. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. It's always fantastic to have you with us. As always, please do make sure you send in your questions or suggestions for guests or topics. Or if you have a question for Ian, hit us up, podcast at truelytics.com. Hit us up on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, just let us know. What do you want to know? Or who do you want to see on the show? Huge thanks to Ian Carnell, of course, as well, for joining me on the show. Fantastic to catch up with Ian. Uh, I was really excited about this episode. I've been wanting to have him on for a while, and I feel like the six-month mark is really that great mark to bring on somebody who's new with the company and hear their perspective, right? Uh, the first few months when you join a company, especially if it's in a new industry for you, you're just getting your feet under you, right? That first month, your head's spinning, right? You're drinking from the fire hose. You have no idea what's going on. You're questioning your decision-breaking process, right? And then uh, the, first, the next couple of months, you know, you're starting to get it a little bit, but the next three months, you're really starting to understand, you're starting to hit the ground running and, and you're, you're getting some new insights, right, on, on things. And you really kind of feel like you have, you have a grasp on things. So super, super grateful for Ian carving some time out and joining us on the show. Hope you're having a wonderful day. As always, please do make sure you're wearing that mask, keeping your distance and be nice to each other, okay? We will see you next time on the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. See ya, bye. <laughs>